Joining the show is author, survivalist, uh, Jim Wesley Rawls. I, he has been a guest on this show once before. He is an author and blogger. He edits the website survivalblog.com. And he has authored uh, his latest book is Survivors, a novel of the coming collapse. Jim, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me on, Peter. All right, so how do you see this coming collapse unravel, and do you think uh, this Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, it could be the beginning of uh, this type of, uh, these types of events uh, un un unraveling here? Yeah, I, th I think you may be right. Um, I think that uh, the average American needs to be feeling a lot more pain before we see mass riots in the streets, but it could happen. You know, as I'm sure you know, there, there's a big divergence of opinion whether we're going to see a deflationary collapse or a, or a hyperinflationary collapse. I'm in, I'm in the inflation camp, personally. And I think once inflation really kicks in, especially with all the, man, the monetizing that's going on right now with quantitative easing, uh, there's going to be a lot of pain. There's going to be a lot of people that literally won't be able to afford to eat because their paychecks are not going to gallop as fast as consumer price inflation. That could lead to riots, and uh, Lord knows, it all all depends on whether or not the power grid stays up. If the grid stays up, yeah. I think we may see a pretty lengthy depression. If the grid goes down, all bets are off. Well, ultimately, I think the grid is going to go down because of lack of power, because as the dollar collapses, our ability to uh, to generate power is going to be greatly diminished. We're not going to be able to, uh, you know, import all these resources from around the world, and many of our own resources are going to be exported to people who have stronger currencies. You know, and the, the, the fact is now these Occupy Wall Street uh, protesters, I read earlier today, one of their goals is they want all debt to be forgiven. They want the government to forgive oh. All student loans, mortgage debt, credit card debt, second lo loans, uh, uh, everything, uh, which is basically what inflation is going to bring about uh, only through a different pathway. Because, you know, they don't seem to understand if you wipe out all the debt, you also wipe out all the bank, all the assets, all the banks are, 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 are gone. All the insurance uh, uh, companies are, are bankrupt. Uh, you know, the pension funds are bankrupt. I mean, you wipe out all this wealth when you wipe out the debt. But the problem is the debt is so large it can't be paid, so that wealth is going to get wiped out, whether the government forgives it or not, because it's going to get wiped out with a printing press. I think you're right, Peter. I think it is a fait accompli at this point. Yeah, and so uh, what, uh, what do you do? So what, what are your, in your book, uh, you know, what is the advice that you're giving? I mean, what should Americans be doing right now to prepare for this? And, of course, usually when people give out this advice, I mean, uh, the media looks at us like or looks at you like you're a kook, uh, you know, because uh, you're preparing for, uh, you know, what, what they believe to be as likely as an alien invasion. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I've, uh, I've moved my family to a very lightly populated rural region west of the Rockies. We've got national forests uh, surrounding our property, and we're pretty well hunkered down. We have a great, huge woodshed full of firewood. We have a large garden. We hunt. We fish. And most of our neighbors are in a, a similar uh, mode. So I think that's probably the safest way to live. Of course, not everybody can do that. Everybody, even somebody that uh, is living in the suburbs and feels stuck can at least lay in a, a good year or two supply of food with storage food and get themselves a, a good quality water filter so they can filter water from the, the runoff from their, their roof, from their downspouts. Yeah, I've advocated so that. Um, things that people can do that will greatly increase their chances of survival. Yeah, I've advocated that, but even I've said even if you don't need the food from a survival standpoint, it's still a pretty good investment because if oh, you're simply yeah. buying products that we, you would have bought anyway a year or two from now, and if a year or two from now uh, the prices are 10 or 20 percent higher, well, that's the same thing as buying a stock and making a 20 percent profit. In fact, it's better because you don't have any capital gains. Uh, you know, you don't have to pay any taxes on the gains because you don't really have any gain. You just eat the food. Yeah. And if it goes up in value between the time you buy it and the time you eat it, uh, the IRS hasn't figured out how to tax us for that yet. Yeah, there's a couple of more advantages. Uh, one is, of course, by buying in bulk, you're also the unit price for each ounce of food you're buying is much lower. Absolutely. That's an advantage. 
And it, it's not just disaster insurance, it's also layoff insurance. If the family has a one- or two-year food supply squared away, if the head of the household gets laid off, at least that's one part of the budget you don't have to worry about during the time you're laid off. Yeah, you got your food covered. So definitely it makes sense to, to cover the basis. So for, uh, for a lot of people, though, the only problem might be they just don't have that much extra storage room, especially if they're living in a city and they're living in a small apartment. Uh, you, know, it's, it's, you know, you barely have room to store, you know, a, a week or two's worth of groceries, uh, let alone a couple of years. Yeah, uh, although I've shown some things in my blog on how people can get, get creative with storage space in terms of, you know, you can you can raise your whole bed by 16 inches and, and make a platform under your bed consisting of five-gallon food-grade plastic buckets full of food. And, that does, you know, that doesn't increase the, the footprint of your bed at all. It just raises it a bit and throw a ruffle, dust ruffle around it, and then nobody even knows it's there. But you're sitting That's on true. That's assuming security. that people aren't already using the area under their bed to store uh, some of their other belongings. <laughs> they might have you know, their tennis racket, their skis, or you know, some of these uh, you know, studio and one-bedroom apartments are pretty small, you know, even the two bedrooms. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you know, there, there are, you know, they have these, uh, you know, these little these little doohickeys, or I forget what they are, where you can really expand your closet space. I mean, so people might have to try to make, make do uh, with the, the small area that they have. Some people could probably rent a small storage facility. Sometimes in some of these apartment buildings, you can rent some extra storage space in the basement. So uh, that might that'd be a solution for some people. Yeah, uh, I do recommend, though, that if people are self-employed or retiring or, or, or near retirement age, that they consider making a move to the boonies now. Uh, two or three years from now, maybe too late. Well, is there a lot of real estate available out in the boonies? Is it, uh, you know, is there, are there, or do you have to, do you have to build the place? It's fallen nationwide, um, including rural areas, and especially, surprisingly, in resort areas. But from a survival standpoint, I don't really recommend resort areas. Uh, for example, if someone wanted to move, someone in California wanted to move Lake Tahoe, well, yeah, prices have come down 40%. For houses at the lake, but if you showed up at your house or cabin in Lake Tahoe right as things were falling apart, who else is going to be showing up? All your neighbors from the big city who are going to bring nothing with them. So you may actually be in a worse situation. Uh, you may end up in a situation where all your neighbors have is guns and no food. That's a bad situation. <laughs> Yep, but you know what about uh, you know for the people though who are you're saying retired people, elderly people? What about uh, you know hospitals or you know things like that? I mean, they need they need to be close enough to medical attention. I mean, what's what's that like out in out in the boonies? Well, there's you know if you move to uh, say thirty or forty miles out of Salt Lake City or thirty or forty miles out of Spokane, Washington, in in the Northwest, uh, there's you know still fairly major medical centers available and. Mm -hmm. You're not that far out, and you're not even all that far out from shopping. But what you've done is put yourself in a more lightly populated food-producing area with plentiful water. I, that's the crucial thing is, is water and food. It's going to come down to that. Yeah, although are they going to be able to protect that food? You know, if you're elderly, you know, you might not be able to, you know, even if you've got, say, some kind of weapon, I mean, you might be easier to be overpowered. There might not be as much police protection out there in the boondocks if uh, some of the people find out that, hey, there's people up there with food. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a very tough uh, future to contemplate, but we will continue discussing it when we get back here on the Peter Schiff Show at ShiffRadio.com. Welcome back. This is Peter Schiff on the air with Jim Wesley Rawls uh, talking survival and his latest book, Survivors, a novel of the coming collapse. Hey, Jim, first of all, why, why do you have a comma in your in your name with separating Wesley from Rawls? What's what's up with that? Uh, it's more of an affectation. Um, it's a common law distinction between to, to show the distinction between my given name, which is my property, and the family's name, which is common property. Yeah, you lost me there. <laughs> <laughs> well, just just chalk it up as a affectation, like the British. So, should my my name should be Peter David, comma Schiff? Well, yeah, since you share that name with Irwin Schiff, for example, right? Um, that's um, your name is is Peter, and his name is you know Irwin, but you're both Schiff, so it, it is a, a common law distinction. 
And it's one that's, you know, fairly arcane, but I like to point it out to people. All right, so every time you sign, when you sign your name or on your credit card, do you have the common in your credit card when you look down or your driver's license? <laughs> it's on most of my legal documents, but yeah. um, it, it definitely throws some of the bureaucrats for a loop. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I want to talk about your, your latest book, which I guess is a novel, so it's not really a how-to survivor's guide. You're actually writing a fictitious account of what might happen uh, during a, a, a collapse, correct? Right, but it is more or less a survival manual dressed as fiction. I, in mo all of my books, I try to squeeze a lot of tactical, practical stuff into a fictional storyline. So there's a so, lot. So I mean, there. so who are the main characters? What I mean, wh when is it supposed to take place? Uh, it's set in the near future. It's set in the exact same time frame as my first novel, Patriots. It's actually contemporaneous, uh -huh. and the main character is a young army officer just being released from active duty in Afghanistan, and everything falls apart. All the commercial flights and the military flights get grounded because simultaneously there's some terrorism going on. He has to make his way all the way from Afghanistan back to his home in New Mexico in the midst of a global socioeconomic collapse. It's quite a why does, why does it he go someplace else? It's like, why does he just he go ahead to New Zealand or someplace? Fiance, I guess he's got his family Mexico. members, yeah. So... Um, it, uh, the, it's basically the novel is a vehicle to talk a lot of, about uh, different tactics and techniques and technologies for family survival, family preparedness. So everything mm -hmm. from firearms to communications, first aid equipment, you name it. It's, it's all there in detail. And it's, it's essentially designed to get people thinking and get people motivated to actually prepare not just be armchair commandos, but actually train and prepare and stock up. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I think something is going to happen that is going to certainly make uh, it may have it may have, it, have it make sense for people to have been prepared. I hope it doesn't get uh, to the point where it's a very violent, dangerous situation uh, to live in the United States. But, you know, if we continue uh, on our current path, that's unfortunately going to be what's going to happen because people are going to react uh, to their circumstances. And if they're unemployed, if they can't afford food, if there's no power because they can't afford energy or if there's, you know, all kinds of rationing going on and people like these kids that are protesting on Wall Street, they're going to be blaming somebody uh, and, and looking at to find somebody you know to to go after someone to attack uh you know just like michael moore i played his sound they want they want to see uh heads roll they want they want people going to jail and if they don't go to jail maybe people will take justice into their own hands that very well could happen and one other thing to consider is that when we had the depression of the 1930s still 20 percent of the population was living on farms and ranches mm -hmm. and now we've got one percent of the population feeding the other 99 percent. So even yeah. if we had a depression on the same scale of, as the 1930s depression, I think we'd see a lot more violence because there's going to be a lot more people starving. People don't have. Oh yeah, we don't have. I mean, everybody is dependent on other people to provide the necessities. I mean, uh, we have a very specialized economy now, and there's an old saying that specialization breeds extinction. And you know. Uh, Part of the problem, too, I just was talking about is the, the psychology and the mentality of the mob. Because you can get a bunch of uh, clear-thinking, clear-headed, law-abiding citizens and put them together in a group. And, and all of a sudden, rationality can go out the window. And people can, can act in ways that they never would have thought they would have acted under normal circumstances and justify uh, violence against people that they feel are somehow responsible uh, for the conditions that they're, that they're in. Yeah, that's absolutely right. A, a few years ago, I was in Reno, Nevada at a Walmart store, and there was a power failure because a large power transformer just down the street blew out. And you should have seen the panic. People were throwing bags of Huggies in their shopping carts and heading for the door. And this was, you know, in a suburban 
you know. Well, that's just a lot of, you know, people might take advantage of an opportunity to steal if they think they can get away with it. But, um, you know, what what I, what I think is going to happen this time is not just people trying to get something for nothing, but people really uh, acting out their frustrations uh, on on society or the members of society, whether it's, you know, going to be the rich. I mean, people who are living in Manhattan, I mean, you have some of the wealthiest people in America within very close proximity of some of the poorest people in America. And uh, it is obviously going to be a dangerous uh, place to be, uh, you know, when it hits the fan. And, you know, and if the governments, of course, if the governments are all broke, the question is, will they be able to afford uh, to provide the type of protection that we're going to need in a climate like that? I I don't think they will. I I often like to say that, that FEMA should actually stand for foolishly expecting meaningful aid. Uh, the, the government is not going to be avail, uh, available or capable to, uh, be, you know, to, to provide any kind of disaster relief if we have a nationwide long-term collapse situation. They can't even handle a short-term localized situation. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a disaster that is not the same as a hurricane or a flood uh, that impacts a particular region. If we're talking about an economic collapse, we're talking about the entire nation being a disaster area. And, of course, you know, the government can't see what the, the way that FEMA works is you take money from one part of the country and give it to the part of the country that has the disaster. But if the whole country is sim- simultaneously suffering the same disaster, where is the money going to come from? That, <laughs> that's a great question, Peter. Uh, yeah. as, as you and I both know, uh, we live in a very fragile, uh, complex society. The chains of supply are thousands of miles long, and we've adopted the Japanese-style Kanban inventory system. So there's no longer a back room yeah. at your local grocery store. All right, well, store. hey, well, thanks for coming on the show again. Let's at least hope in, the, in this time around that uh, fiction is much stranger than reality and uh, your book doesn't end up uh, being a prophecy uh, and more of a just a sci-fi fantasy. <laughs> but anyway, be prepared just in case. Anyway, everybody else, we will be back. We have another half hour coming.